<laughs> so anyway, I'm uh, delighted that you're here. The, uh, this exhibition has been a two-part exhibition and event has been uh, a long, um, long in the making. Yeah, we can, we'll move over a little yes, bit. Yes, um, I think so. Okay. And uh, I'm John Stewart, I'm Associate Dean for Cultural and Community Engagement at FIU's mm -hmm. College of Communication, Architecture and the Arts. I happen to be a, um, an architect as well and I'm very appreciative of this of this um, of this work and this experience, and I want to introduce our. Um, well, first thank thank our our co-sponsors with us, the ECC and the um, and Ava and Renee and and Lena and uh, it's you're, it's all it's great that you're here, and um, I want to introduce our our panelists. So what we will do is we'll have we this is the structure we've agreed to twenty minutes each, now to have an architect speak for 20 minutes and end on time is, is a thing. Uh, so, I, but I, we have professionals here. Um, oh, we have to get, we'll, we'll fix that. And then uh, Claudia and Gustavo will speak for 20 minutes and then we hope that they'll have a question for each other at the end about their work so they'll actually have a discussion uh, that will entail both of them and any questions that you may have. And we can take questions also downstairs at the uh, reception, so. Um, so Curtis, I'll start with uh, Curtis Ventress. Curtis is an internationally acclaimed architect with a portfolio of public projects worth over $43 billion. In 2019, he was conferred the degree of honorary doctor of fine arts from the North Carolina State University. In 2010, he was a recipient of the American Institute of Architects Thomas Jefferson Award, considered, which is considered the highest honor in public architecture worldwide. He remains at the forefront of civic design and is consistently recognized for his innovative design portfolio, receiving more than 600 awards and accolades and featured in over 10,000 national and international articles and books. He's a fellow of the AIA for extraordinary design contributions to the profession. Um, and I'll, how about this? I'll just, I'll introduce you guys when you start, all right? And then we'll, um, and we'll, we'll yeah, it's better, thank you. Peanut gallery agrees. <laughs> These guys go to everything. So, I'd also like for you to have the um, to have the mic. Oh, if you like, okay. see how you how it feels. Because sure. then you don't have to really speak very loudly. Do I need it? Yes. Yeah. I okay. think you might. Uh, all right. Yeah, my voice is getting kind of weak. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you guys speak over the three D printers. Oh yeah. Okay. It's hard to. Uh, Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk for 20 minutes or so about the future of air travel and some of the projects that we have done as Ventress Architects. And so, uh, you know, what is the real future of air travel? You know, I think more and more people in the sky. At this point in time, there's about uh, a million people in the sky, even though we're in pandemic mode. Before pandemic uh, hit, we were at about close to a million and a half people in the sky at any one moment. Um, so it's, it's near a million at this point in time, which is a lot of people when you think about it being in the sky all at once. And we are looking at uh, nine billion people before the pandemic. So at some point, the pandemic will subside and be over and we'll be back to those kind of numbers. So we do get a chance to take a deep breath and think about what the future will be. And I would say that the future of architecture and of uh, air terminals is all going to uh, be affected dramatically by this list of things here, which I'm going to just touch on a little bit. We're already seeing these kind of things uh, affect architecture, uh, everything from our homes to uh, big buildings as well. So uh, the Internet of Things, keeping all these uh, uh, smart devices uh, involved in the design of things. And, you know, we have them in our hand. I can change the temperature in my house back in Colorado. I can, uh, if the alarm goes off, it comes on my phone. I can turn it off and, because I know that the gardener is there and uh, I can keep the police from coming. 
due to the airport. And so you're going to see these first, uh, may, may take a decade or two, but first we're seeing them deliver packages and uh, we're seeing it in search operations. Uh, so you can deploy 20 drones out there looking for a plane that's down instead of having one helicopter that is flying around uh, with spotters looking for that plane that went down. And they're used to deliver medical supplies in Africa and other places. Robotics, you can see uh, a lot of changes in buildings, uh, everything from your uh, theater that you go to, to uh, air terminals and, and other buildings, little masses of people show up uh, directing you and answering questions. And just yesterday, I saw an article in the Denver newspaper about robotics taking, giving medical exams, routine medical exams being given by robots in some of the rural areas around Colorado, around Denver. So they um, speed up things and you have to have less doctors because you have more robots that are taking your temperature and your blood pressure and all the prepping things that need to go on before you see the doctor. And then we see uh, how they're helping with wayfinding in airports. actually in an airport that we designed here where you see a picture of uh, in Incheon, South Korea. So you can walk up in more than one language. You can give them directions as to where you are and how you need to, where you need to go to find the next robot to tell you what the next thing is because you humans can't remember too much. <laughs> so uh, uh, we're finding them already uh, being introduced changes we're seeing in uh, airports, these sleeping venues on the upper left, are, are something that we see, we did those in South Korea years ago, and now they're, they're catching on in many other terminals as well. Uh, facial recognition, uh, very big deal. Some of us may live long enough to see that there's only no pilots in there <laughs> flying the plane. And essentially we're getting on it like a drone. Biometrics are everywhere. For me to come here, I uh, went through, had my eye scan, and uh, you know, I thought, I've always thought it was a little ridiculous that they would just scan my eye and then know who I am. But you know, I think a fingerprint, the same way facial recognition, but I have to say that a scan of my eye is probably much better than that uh, worn out driver's license I carry in my pocket. The guy is uh, always asking, you know, when I go to a bar, they ask me for my driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. Lucky me, yeah. <laughs> I, I tip real heavy if I get asked for my driver's license. So, um, and then renewable energy, these things are popping up we have a lot of these things popping up across the western United States. If you go to um, the North Sea, you see these things everywhere, out in the ocean. And um, I, I question the longevity of some of these. Uh, steel and salt water don't really do too well together. But, uh, you know, uh, this is a uh, energy source that's renewable and is catching on more and more every day, wind power, solar power, and airports have lots of space that they are able to rent out to the electric company or to other companies and, and put out solar panels and generate a lot of electricity. And then raising our own fuel on airports is a concept that is being looked at a lot. It's very it's being thought of uh, a lot. Here you can see we don't have quite that many um, of these uh, blades at the wind farm there in Colorado yet, but it won't surprise me that there'll be that many very soon. And we're seeing a lot of new concepts.
steps in the shopping. Uh, for instance, the big shopping center on the right uh, uh, is trying to be biomorphic. Uh, it's really like a rainforest exhibit in a shopping center with about four million square foot of shopping uh, at the airport in, uh, in uh, Singapore. And it's an incredible space, but there is no shopping inside. It's just a wonderful place to go, experience this water falling, the mist, and see the plants. And, and there are a few restaurants that come down at it, and uh, a people mover that goes through it. So, but it is dramatic, and it's become the image of that airport. So this big data thing is taking over. They're tracking every passenger. Where are they going? Why are they going there? Taking that behavior into consideration, creating lots of charts and things. And, you know, you go, well, this is really not going to shape the future, but it may shape where airports are uh, because they're trying to, as Wayne Gretzky said, be where the fuck is going to be. They're trying to skate <laughs> out there where the passengers want to be. And so they're trying to analyze that data. And out of that data came the whole idea of hubbing airports where airlines created hubs where you fly into Denver, change planes, go somewhere else, or you fly into Pittsburgh if you're on a different kind of airline, change planes and go somewhere else. So the shapes of the airports are going to change a little bit, and the next series of things I'm going to show you are uh, the recreation of uh, hypersonic travel. This is a boom aircraft, which uh, is trying to uh, reincarnate the idea of hypersonic flights. It carries about 100 people, and um, they're using all the new technologies of materials and engines and, and uh, all of that to create and resolve a lot of the problems that the previous aircraft had that were trying to fly hypersonic. And so look at that, and then look at this. This thing carries like 700 people. Oh, wow. Um, there's only one prototype that exists. And as you can see, only one group, NASA, could afford it. <laughs> mm. Mm. Uh, nevertheless, it was an opportunity for Boeing to create something that could be part of the future because this one takes less energy per passenger than anything else flying. And then this one could certainly pick you up at your house. It's a tri-fan. It, it's like a helicopter. It goes straight up and then uh, you can kind of see the engine rotates and then it flies like an airplane for take about a dozen people uh, 500 miles and then there are many different versions of this this is some of the things that uber is testing out uh, pick you up downtown on top of a building and whisk you off to the airport of course that's been done with helicopters but they plan on doing this in multi-level facilities and uh, doing it at a lower cost so that uh, more people will use it. Now our firm has created a uh, competition for students that we have been running for 10 years now and we get more and more submissions every year as students around the world are interested in air, air terminals and this is uh, this year's winner. Uh, we haven't announced it to the public yet, so you're free to see something that uh, will be announced later this week. Um, it's a team of uh, folks that designed this, uh, two people, and they created an airport in uh, Elkhorn, Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, I think when you look at the airport, and I read some of the jury comments, they, uh, they really jury was wowed by this this particular building because it looked like fun. It looked like a place that they said they would like to spend time, mm -hmm. which is interesting. People still want to spend time in certain places and other places they really don't want to be. But they cited this uh, control tower that goes up and had a hotel under it and then the, uh, the, uh, the ribbon piece that goes up was like a tram system so you could ride it through the terminal and ride it up and around and down and so this whole idea of a, like a roller coaster going through the building was really intriguing and so 
thought-provoking for the jury. Um, there's another one that had a, something that I'm not sure if it really works technically of these pods align and create the runways. Mm. And then you have the um, building, which was very alluring. The forms of the building were dramatic and striking. The way they handled light inside the building was impressive and kind of pulled you into the building. the fact that you could land and then get into a boat and then arrive at the terminal was also something unique to the jury. And then, you know, how do these buildings adapt in the future? Um, that's a constant problem. So, you know, 25 years ago we did this building in Denver. The big thing then was sustainability. We, after that one, we won this competition in Incheon. And the big problem there was winning the competition, of course. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's a building that handles uh, 55 747s at one time. Big building. Uh, big space creating a heart in the building is very important. Here was a renovation of a building in Seattle. We created this new space in the middle of the building, which is a, kind of giving this building a heart a sense of place, a place people want to spend time. Interesting that the jury would come to that same kind of conclusion. And then in Sacramento, a building that uh, is kind of fun, it has a big red rabbit in the middle. So we have the introduction of art in the building and art in a way that it's entertaining and makes you smile when you walk through the building, which makes it a pleasant place to be. Another building in uh, San Jose, California, um, which is kind of fun. It's unrolling a computer table. Um, so it takes a little bit longer than I have to explain how that works. In Raleigh, North Carolina, a place that's pleasant, you know, it says Carolina. It's got wood inside. The wood uh, beams make it feel very homey. It makes it feel very much like Carolina to the people in that area. And then, uh, Project we did in Los Angeles, um, another action thrill filled place. Lots of high end shopping inside and big TV monitors, big screens uh, with the multimedia show constantly going. And something that uh, doesn't repeat for the passenger. Again, creating a sense of place inside uh, a tower, which will be the new image. Stays and one on the left there uh, disappears in the future. And then we're also working on something that's kind of interesting and, and real diverse from these very huge, big things are airports that are very small. And these airports um, want a different kind of feeling a feeling of uh, maybe a club. Uh, but yet, uh, that one, the first one is at the Boeing plant called Payne Field. The second one is in uh, Austin, Texas. And so this is the curbside drop-off. We renovated an old hangar building to create this, but it has this kind of weird Austin feel. And you know, that's the thinking of Austin. Keep Austin weird. <laughs> and then Orlando, this is under construction and will be opening probably the second quarter of the year. see more of this in the exhibit downstairs, but this building is um, very dramatic and will have uh, two or three different uh, multimedia presentations inside the building that will make the building much more memorable in the future. And the last one there is uh, a competition we did um, years ago in China that uh, I think Mr. Foster finally won. Oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Thank you know, very much. Minutes, but no, I, that was great. No, really appreciate it. Um, I'll get the, I'll come get the mic. Pass that on. And let's um, undo that. Oh, I, yes, I'm supposed to start. Exactly. 
<laughs> so uh, next we have, um, and that was a really wonderful presentation. I, I, I love that you kind of kept us guessing where it was going <laughs> at, at the beginning and um, really you know, wandering through the future and then how you kind of addressed that in your firm was, uh, was really brilliant. So um, next we have uh, uh, Claudia Bush and Gustavo Barenboom, uh, Barenboom Bush Architects. It's an award-winning firm uh, in Miami ba uh, based on architecture planning and interior design. And they specialize in marine and port projects around the world. So we have another transportation, um, a connection here with transportation. Um, and as cities evolve, they do too, incorporating game-changing and innovative design concepts that add value to the clients and communities they so proudly serve. With over 50 years of joint experience, the principals work closely with their team of exceptional designers in a practice that places technology, that I'll, I'll kind of tweak that in, in a second, um, but places technology, sustainability, and the advancement of the human experience at the center of its work. BBA just recently designed a 200,000 square foot cruise terminal for Carnival Cruise Line, the Port of Miami, that will be completed in the fall of 2022, so in about a year. Did you get it? All right, were we yes. not? All right, perfect. All so, right. so thank you very much. Thank you, and, and uh, let me first congratulate Curtis for his body of work and incredible insights on the industry. Thank it was It was very nice, your presentation. Um, so, you know, Claudia and I have been uh, practicing architecture for a while, uh, but we have our practice together for the last 10 years. Um, and one of our specialties, like John was saying, is cruise terminal design. Uh, cruise terminals are the little cousins of, um, of the big airport projects. Of course, it has to do with transportation, so you're moving people, luggage, and a lot of stuff through it. But it works slightly different. Um, in a way, uh, the cruise terminals that are home port and that have ships uh, dedicated to them it has a lot of activity when the ship is in town and they are closed when the ship is not there. That's a little bit different in terms of airports that are mostly working 24 seven with a lot of activity during, during the day. So the, these buildings are hyper used on a very short period of time and a lot of things have to be resolved so it's very smoothly. There's an old saying in the industry that it says it should take you five and no more than 10 minutes from drop off till you get to the ship. So a lot of these buildings in itself don't have a lot of things happening inside. They, they are uh, vessels to get you to the ship very fast. Um, Claudia, go back to what I wanted to say. Uh, so you can see a, 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 a ship like the Inspiration that maybe was 15 or 20 years old and it was a big ship then. And, and these huge ships today, right, uh, that have 6,000 passengers, practically 2,000 crew members. Um, if, if I read you the, 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 read, the, the list of uh, uh, bottles of wines and <laughs> eggs and salmon that goes into one, one of those things to maintain uh, one week people in the ship, it's just unbelievable. Um, so th this transformation of small ship to big ship uh, has completely transformed the industry in, it, in itself. And for the last 100 years, you know, people have taken ships, of course we know that. Uh, and traditionally they were like leftovers in the port. They were warehouses that had been uh, transformed into a, a cruise terminal. Because the main activity, the way money making in the port was cargo, bulk. And so, uh, what happened is that with that transformation of these ships, suddenly crews turns around the business at the ports and generate a lot of money now, to the point that in some ports is the, the principal means of sustaining that port. And so the, the, the thinking of the port has changed. It's not anymore a warehouse, right? It's become architecture, more sophisticated. And the guests uh, expect that, have higher expectations today. So we're gonna show you four projects, and we'll start with Tenerife. So also if we create a cruise terminal, it's, you will restart the voyage. So it's, you know, the travel doesn't start only on the ship. The travel starts 
when we enter the cruise terminal. So that experience is also important uh, for the design of the cruise terminals. And often, sure, these terminals are also located in beautiful water edge. So here in Tenerife, it's, it's right um, on the, below the historical city. And you can see you know, to, the, to the top, you can see there's the walkway, the Alhambra, um, which you know, all the uh, people spend time on um, after, after hours. So this was the terminal in Tenerife. It was um, an adapted reuse. We used two existing warehouses that we transformed into the cruise terminal. And uh, the question was, how do we kind of transform this existing warehouse into something exciting that conveys the idea of travel, right? We want people to be, even though they're spending very little time in these buildings, and there's no shopping inside, by the way. Uh, it's just check in, waiting for a few minutes, and you're moving in the ship. We wanted that experience to be meaningful. And so on the outside, we completely, it's adapted, we need a, an adaptive reuse to this, um, buildings, adding new components um, uh, to bring it up to date in terms of technology, and then mixing mixing the technologies is wood on the inside and, and uh, steel on the outside. So the areas where you circulate, where everybody comes in virtually to embark or debark, were these um, red volumes, and we created them inspired by actually topography of, of Tenerife. And go back for one second. Okay, and so we, we actually joined them together by gladding the existing and the new with one material to create one skin and becoming one terminal. And then here you can see the inside, it was built in mass timber. Actually, it's a great um, product, um, very sustainable. We did not use any steel or concrete structure. You know, our idea was to, to have a finish inside, right? And we never thought that we were going to be exposing mass timber until we saw it built. And, uh, and then we say, well, we, we have a lot of fun. This is beautiful. Let's just varnish the wood and we leave it like this. Of course, we never said that, right? We always said, no, this is what we thought from day one. The idea of the clash, as architects, I can tell you a story, the clash on the outside of the steel and the warmth of the wood inside. But to be honest with you, that was an afterthought, and we are very happy that this accident occurred. So this is the existing steel structure of the warehouses, and this is then um, the conversion into the new uh, waiting area. And interesting here too, um, the uh, director of Carnival told us, did you have the idea that this looks like uh, the ship upside down? Oh, for sure, oh. we did that. <laughs> <laughs> And a last view with the mountains in the background, um, and um, you know we, we were very happy with the result and the, ci the city as well. Um, so uh, it, it, we, we think it works very well uh, there. The second project we're going to show you is in Japan, uh, in Sasebo, it's the Uronashira cruise terminal. And uh, this is a beautiful, picturesque little village uh, with very little tourism, and uh, surrounded by mountains and fishermen uh, quays uh, that you can see. So here we certainly studied, um, you know, design and the culture of, of this place, and we wanted to be responsive this, to this very beautiful environment and be very minimalistic. So the only thing is we design the roof. <laughs> this this roof that you can see to the right is like, like a leaf falling down on the ground. And um, now this one is also how we designed the, wa like the, the water edge and we wanted to bring people into the terminal. This is always a challenge because the terminal is an exchange of border control, there's high security and you know, how do you bring the people in? So in this case, we um, designed the walkway that brings you around with the event space on the second floor, and we made the ground floor to keep 
um, for, for the cruise passengers and the custom. Now this is a unique cruise terminal. It's a cru cruise terminal designed in Japan for the Chinese market. So the, the Chinese, when they go to Japan, they have a list of things to buy for the whole family back home. So it's like a flea market inside the cruise terminal. Uh, you, they just go in and they buy everything, you know, from razors to boom boxes, and, uh, and, and most of them stay there until the ship leaves in the afternoon. Uh, they, they are reluctant to spend money in excursions and going to the aquarium or things like that. And so it was an interesting challenge for us to design a cruise terminal that acts like a market, right? And that, that in a way contradicts the essence of just being very quickly out of the building. Uh, in that sense, it's more like a creating a sense of place similar to an airport. And, and I think that is also the building has the character of that. And here just uh, in terms of structure, so you know, the challenge was here to create this beautiful open roof where we you know, designed uh, the, the truss system. The third project is in the Panama, uh, Panama Canal. Uh, it's right at the entrance and uh, it's a very, very interesting location because there's an ecological uh, park that you see there. And uh, not only that, but uh, I think the House of Noriega used to be a couple of blocks away. <laughs> so there's a lot of history, especially from the Americans, to that, to that side. So yeah, we are lucky to work with beautiful places, always surrounded by water. So this one was actually an island that only half exists, and the other half was reclaimed land. And it was a competition um, that we lost to the Chinese. Um, but um, very important was uh, the sustainability. So we incorporated um, um, solar roofs and um, passive strategies as such as active. But the most important thing was for us to create a park to, to offset the carbon footprint and also to reduce the carbon footprint as much as possible. And we achieved it by, by okay, this is also, we created a park to be integrated also more with the public. Again, uh, Gustavo was saying that um, the cruise terminal is mainly used during the day or a couple of days during the week and then it's empty. But um, you know, more and more there's also an interest to, to integrate it with public use. So here we integrated with a park on the tip of the island to create a, um, for the tourism of, of uh, the Amado Island. And um, the parking, we, we responded to keep it as minimal as possible by creating these huge bougainvillea roof canopies and make it disappear and then also to have the it very open, the terminal, so when uh, the passenger actually travels through, they all, uh, already uh, can experience the environment. And as I said, we um, created the least amount of air conditioned space, and every other space we used uh, natural ventilation. Um, you know, one area which is really large uh, for cruise terminals, the package, uh, the baggage claim, um, where we created like an air chimney and cross ventilation. And this is the arrival space, also the lobby, the whole arrival we kept outdoor in order to really experience again this beautiful island. Oops. The last project we want to show you, if the computer allows us to do so, is in Miami. And that's the cruise terminal that we are currently doing for Carnival. When completed next year, is going to be the biggest cruise terminal for them in the US. Um, and it's a compendium of existing and new buildings. Uh, it's not going to be as flashy as the Norwegian Cruise Line terminal that you see there. Um, and, um, but I think it's going to be interesting uh, uh, as well in its own right. Um, so, you know, there's always this dilemma with the, with the cruise terminals, right? The density, like I was saying at the beginning, um, and, and normally the territory 
the real estate for cruise terminal is very mm. compact because you're working in existing port environments. And um, so uh, we have to resolve a lot of issues of, uh, of um, you know, uh, luggage and buses and, and provisions and crews and, and all operating in this in these port situations. Um, and but finally, I think the cruise lines they finally realized that the cruise terminal is part of the traveling experience. This, for you, girlies that you know do airports, it's an obvious thing. But for the cruise lines, the business was in the ship, was not in the building. It's only recently when these things have gotten very sophisticated and the passengers actually expect quality that they started to look at buildings uh, with the same eyes as you know airports and other things like that. So this is Miami. What you see in blue are uh, buildings that we are adding within these white buildings that are there and trying to transform, which is a complex uh, challenge. How do you transform the experience when you face with 70% of structures that are there already and you don't have an unlimited budget, right? So one of the things that we did is from the passenger side, from the arrival or uh, embarkation, when you are with the buses and, and, and the drop off, we created a system of canopies that actually envelope you and that's what you see of the building. So the canopies, when you're under the canopies, you basically don't see those facades. Um, and uh, it's quite interesting in itself. Um, uh, you know, we regarded some of the structures that were there and we try to bring a more jovial, happy feeling to these buildings uh, and uh, that tying them together so that they want have one common language. So following up on the happy feeling, yes, we want to make the terminals joyful. It's where you start a happy trip. So this is actually where we created uh, a screen at the end where people wave, they can, you know, they go through a tunnel where they can see the ocean. And already the, the, the travel starts already at the terminal. And um, this is already the first images of the terminal. So one theme was, I mean, it was, um, I think how long was all the buildings to go there? I think 600 feet mm -hmm. long, you know, 400 feet long. Much more, it's like 1,200. 1,200 feet long. So to give a wayfinding for people to go through, actually we always, you know, one of the things is really to make it simple that you, how you walk through from the beginning to go to the ship. We created this uh, very long and colorful carpet. Um, to to emphasize you know the the travel and the experience. Also, we incorporate in large scale of art um, to really make this place much more fun and lively. Yeah, and on the right you can see the image. It's being half built uh, at the moment, and uh, already operating for not for Carnival but for MSC. And the VIP uh, with a more nautical and elegant, um, you know, flair um, with more materials. Uh, that is, this this building is an addition uh, to the existing. And this is the building under construction. The one, the VIP that we see, it's a fairly large space um, to really bring also the sense of place there. Um, this on the right, you can see it from the exterior shaping up and this is the intention for the for the future to see it from the causeway and that shows that the terminal is not just only an experience from the passengers but also an experience uh, for the city of people that drive by and i think that concludes our presentation <laughs> thank you that's very impressive. So um, thank you guys so much for sharing your work. And I, I thought maybe, um, Dr. Fentress, would you like to make, <laughs> I couldn't help it. I'm so impressed by that. Um, maybe you'd like to make a, a comment or start. I was hoping to have a discussion maybe between you. You started the conversation, since you both have working in such similar areas. They're cousins of each other. And it's so interesting, I think. Yeah, they're, they're fascinating uh, cousins in a way. I mean, they both are long spans yeah. in terms of the roofs, and they have a lot of opportunities architecturally. 
with the roof to comply with the forms. Um, but they all both have really tight budgets mm -hmm. uh, for what people want. Yet those budgets are, as we were talking earlier, are extraordinary per square foot. Mm -hmm. um, you could build five houses for the cost of <laughs> one square foot of one of these, uh, either of these buildings, building types. But it's interesting that all the people show up at about the same time, and they all want to not stand in line, but they, yet they all have to go through some kind of uh, security, who they are, and are they the right person that registered to be on this boat or on this plane? And then they have a lot of luggage with them. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make sure that that stuff is safe since 9-11. We're mm -hmm. very all cognizant of how much damage a suitcase full of explosives could do. Mm -hmm. uh, it could sink a ship, it could mm -hmm. bring down an airplane. So um, you have to you have the security of the people. Mm -hmm. Are they the right ones in both cases? Mm -hmm. And uh, the security of what they're carrying with them. Mm -hmm. Is it clear to go on this voyage one way mm -hmm. or the other? They have a lot of commonalities, and it's interesting to see the evolution of mm -hmm. both of them to mm -hmm. me, in the sense that uh, you know we're, we're creating um, spaces in airports where uh, it used to be that uh, you didn't worry about food, for instance. But then, with the uh, the industry changing, and all of a sudden there's all these uh, less expensive flights, and they don't have any food. They mm -hmm. don't even have peanuts. Maybe they have water um, and on the cheap flights. And uh, so people are at the airport running around trying to get a sandwich and take it on the plane with them or eat something before they get on because they're going to fly for two or three hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't have food service necessarily in the terminal because you're trying to get them on the boat. Mm -hmm. That's where they would sell food right. or, you know, right. go. people go to the, the food on the boats. The margarita. That's all you can eat. <laughs> so the, nobody wants to pay for food because they've already paid for their, their, their trip on the boat. So uh, it, it has some things that are really different in that sense. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that one, uh, they must have done a study and found out, well, okay, the Chinese want to buy a lot of stuff, and therefore we can create a terminal that they will buy in, and we'll make more money than if they come here and then they go downtown. So they figured that out somehow. That's where the big data stuff comes in. Right. What is the behavior of these passengers? And, uh, you know, there's a terminal in um, Dubai that uh, I was in changing planes one night coming from um, some Singapore to Europe, and I was walking around just looking, and I noticed all these people shopping. They're all carrying bags. They're Chinese again, and they all were carrying two bags. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to sit down and fall asleep for a little while before the flight. I couldn't find a seat in the entire building. <laughs> but what I, what I witnessed then is that all these Chinese people are sitting in the chairs like this, holding their bags <laughs> in their <laughs> sleep. <laughs> they occupied every chair in the terminal. <laughs> and they got about three hours of sleep after shopping, uh, get all they could carry, and then they changed planes. And I've been told that a lot of people come through there two or three times a year just to go shopping in yes. this air terminal in Dubai, <laughs> which is kind of somewhat like the terminal yeah. in Japan. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of similarities, but the, yeah. the difference is uh, many people spend more time in air terminals, I think. Yes. They probably spend more time, ultimately, than they may spend in the air. Yeah. Uh, mm. Interesting. You may have some different thoughts. I think also some of the things you pointed out, like the biometrics, um, the pandemic has accelerated the change in the cruise tra uh, you know, buildings in the cruise industry because they were already changing slowly, but then the pandemic completely blew that away in the sense that uh, today um, you are pre-checking at home, right? Uh, you're filling all these forms, everything at, at, at home. They're sending you home uh, your tax to print. Sorry, you know, uh, you show up and you're pre-checked, basically. Yeah. We are 
getting rid of all the check-in counters, right, Claudia? We have podiums, uh, biometric devices um, for embarkation and debarkation. So suddenly, what are we doing with the space of these buildings when before you had to queue 500, 1,000 uh, people or so, and, and, and now they are not waiting because they are pre-checked. So we are creating lounges. We are creating a much more interesting experience uh, for the passenger uh, on, on, on these buildings. Um, but some of the same things that affect airports affect uh, cruise lines. Well, we few things. We're designing for, uh, for Miami 1,200 seats waiting area, which is probably used only five times a year. And um, <laughs> even not even five times. And they do this because, you know, when a ship doesn't uh, leave or there's problems, that one has those seats for those emergency. But now, actually, there's a shift with COVID. Um, there's a shift in the, with the cruise lines that they start thinking, OK, what can we do with these spaces, um, you know, not doing the use um, with the seating? Do we really need it? And it depends certainly on the, on the, on, on the cruise lines. So um, one has to see, you know, what we are doing with these spaces. Yeah. Um, term we use called non-airline revenue uh -huh. and of course both of these buildings are all about revenue or mm -hmm. making your revenue flow besides the fact of helping people get off the street and into an airplane or off the street and onto the ship so um, it's how do you retool your mind to think about non-shipping non-cruise line that's what they, they probably are most interested in with the clubs, with the uh, upscale um, areas to sit, uh, serving drinks, serving food, that sort of thing. Uh, and what else can one do to create more revenue as you pass through this you know, space? Because that helps us as architects have more better right. budget, maybe get $1,200 a foot, and we create a more dramatic, exciting so people, instead of uh, milling around, uh, they come in on the airplane, instead of milling around somewhere else, they go to yeah. the terminal, air to the cruise terminal. <coughs> yeah. So the majority of the, of, of the of, you know, the, the money, the revenue is generated uh, per head, you know? Um, and uh, per passenger uh, counts. And per passenger, they pay the port X amount of money that they have pre-negotiated. Um, where we see an interesting development is that uh, a cruise terminal as event spaces, you know, in as much as ports want to deal with that, you know. And so, for example, there's a huge business for weddings, yeah. um, and the VIP, which is for 500 people, I mean, it's, it's huge uh, if you think that probably there are going to be only 100 people there. Um, they're saying, no, 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 we're going to have maybe catering. We're going to rent this space for weddings. But I said, how many people are going to come and marry here or, 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 or then go to the ship? No, 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 the guys who go uh, to the ship is only the bride and the, and the groom and maybe their parents or so. The rest are going to come here to this type of events and then they leave. So that, you know, that shows the, the, the change in mentality. And in other cruise terminals like um, in San Diego and perhaps in the future in New York, we are part of a park system that is the waterfront of, a, of an urban environment, um, like Vancouver also. Uh, they are thinking how to integrate park and terminal, right? To make, like the convention center in, in, in Vancouver, right? So to, to make something that, that can play a role of an extension of the park, right? That has activities that are compatible when the cruise is there, maybe the pier is closed and it's a secure environment. But when the ship is not there, that's a beautiful place to stroll, right? To use it for a market on the weekends and incorporate that as part of the park. <laughs> Did you want to? I want to just tell you how they really make the most amount of cash 
and we will have to put in. It's not so architectural interesting. <laughs> Photo booths. Uh, you know when you come in, so this was the thing. We started designing the terminal. We put the photo booths on the side. I didn't want to have a rendering scene, all the photo booths when you look into it. No, photo booths have to be in the center. Everybody has to walk through. We need a minimum of eight photo booths. <laughs> and this is the most important thing. Again, the terminal is actually, they go, they don't really spend time in the terminal. So actually our experience is, all the terminals, we don't really design any other thing for revenue. Um, from Royal Caribbean, somebody told us this, it's also an issue of operation. So they focus what they focus is on their cruises. That's where their mind is. Other things are other people. So also version are the first, they already changed. They have a kitchen in their terminal. And I think one can have weddings there probably. So there is a shift, you know, as everybody's spending more and more money on those terminals, I think there is a shift towards that. So, so I, I do, what you just said made me think of, uh, you know, in Colorado, I get invited to these uh, cowboy events. And, uh, <laughs> as a cowboy often, or as a spectator? Uh, well, they're uh, like black tie dinner. Uh, they're fundraisers and they're in a big cattle barn. And they, you know, the cattle go to be made into steak, and they, uh, so it's empty for a while, and so they they clean it up, then they put down uh, grass, uh, artificial turf, and uh, so the place has got like a carpet over the whole place, and then they get a country western band, and they have a stage at one end, and so they transform this barn. Yep. It still has a little barn smell. But they transform it into, <laughs> you know, a, a, like the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I, as you were talking about the weddings, yeah. I uh, was recently at a hotel where they were having a giant Indian wedding. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those, but they party for days. With elephants and everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I was thinking, you know, you could also do concerts. Oh, yeah. yeah because yeah. this is a great space yeah. to do concerts. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Good point. Good point. Let me see if anybody in the audience has a question. Don, you can look. <laughs> I didn't have to look far. If there's anybody else who wants, has a question, I'll get to you. You all, you all talk a lot about uh, customer satisfaction and revenue maximization. I guess the question is, uh, when you do a design, will you focus group that or survey uh, consumers, or will your clients do that to get feedback? Uh, and I just have to say, I love driving the MacArthur Causeway and seeing the new Norwegian and RCL cruise mm -hmm. terminals. Can't wait to see yours. It is spectacular at night. I love the way they change. And it almost sort of reminded me 60 years ago, you know, these people try to catch your eye, and now I guess with cruise terminals and airport, mm -hmm. that's the next thing for us uh, Boyer, that's a good Boyers point. watching the world. Did you want to respond, or do you, I, I could pass this question. <laughs> It's interesting when you said that. I thought you were going to kind of chastise us a little bit for being so uh, <laughs> into uh, the, the money operation side of these buildings. But uh, the reality in architecture is that that's what makes the building: no return, no building. Mm -hmm. So we we as architects have to figure that out. And I think uh, for the students that might be in the room, you know, uh, the form is important, but often have to justify it as to how it will benefit the people you're building it for. If it's the cruise ship people or it's the uh, airport, how's it going to enhance the passenger experience and how's it going to enhance them, them, the clients, making more money at the end of the day. And so we all have to consider that and think about that. And then we sneak the architecture in when they're not looking. <laughs> 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 In, in the cruise industry, they, they have metrics for everything. Uh, they pull you, you know, when you go in the ship, when you go out the ship, when, when you're dining. It, it, it's amazing. That's not shared with the public, and, and not even with us. Uh, sometimes we get a glimpse, no? because they say 65% of our guests, so and so, you know? And, uh, but but they, they, they know, they know exactly what's happening. Um, and 
like everything, they want to focus on guest experience. They, they want to make sure that when you leave that terminal, that building, you're coming back to the next trip in, in Carnival, right, or whatever that might be. So for them, you know, it's very important that the, those first five minutes when you get in the building, that you form an impression of your experience, uh, and then the last five when you leave that building and you go home, that you have a very, very good experience. Anybody else have a anybody else have a question that they'd like to pose to our distinguished <laughs> panelists? No, seeing none. If not, I want to just thank you both for and you all for a amazing presentation. <laughs> Wonderful discussion. It was just what we were all hoping would happen, and there were so many so many areas of commonality. And I'm hoping that you will all um, take advantage of uh, the reception that's starting downstairs on the first floor, um, where there's an exhibition of, of the work of, of, these, of these architects. And uh, there will be some light sacks and uh, beverages down there too. And I, I also wanted to make sure that you take a look around you, because these are photographs of um, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi, I think, took some of them. But they're mostly Denise Scott Brown's work in, um, in Venice, starting in, in uh, Venice, Italy, going to Venice, California, and then obviously the work in, in, um, in Las Vegas. But also, she has pictures that she took uh, and, and were printed especially for us in, uh, from her study of Washington Avenue in 1978. So uh, if you want to see a little bit of, uh, I would just take a tour around this, this space and, and really, it, it's worth it to look closely at some of these images, just to read the texts that are on them. And the, the, she, has a, she captured some great moments in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas history and in Washington history. So. Anyway, with that, I, I thank you all for being here. Uh, it was a really wonderful, um, wonderful panel discussion, and thank you again. Thank you.